Uh, we're going to continue on with uh, Faraday's Law. Which, as we've seen it in two different forms, the EMF, the, what's called the induced EMF, being equal to a negative rate of change of magnetic flux through some area, or we can also write that as a curly electric field, the electric field integral, path integral around a closed path. Integrate the electric field, the curly electric field around the closed path, and you will get the same thing as the rate of change of the magnetic flux through the area bound by that path. Okay, and we saw we did some problems last time, kind of applying this. Uh, I want to uh, do a couple more examples of some applications with this that you will be having to do for homework either for Friday or next week. Uh, and I want to take a little aside here and talk about something we briefly mentioned before, but a distribution of current called a solenoid. Okay, so when I say a solenoid, what do I mean? Well, we've seen a coil. We've seen a, a loop of current, for example. Uh, if I have, if I draw a current loop this way, conventional current going that way, then that's going to produce, inside the loop, it's going to produce a magnetic field pointing out, and then elsewhere it's going to pr produce a magnetic field pointing in the opposite direction. We've seen this um, dipole pattern. This is a magnetic dipole. So we've seen this pattern of magnetic dipole fields before. If I draw the loop edge on where the current is coming, conventional current is coming out at the top, going in at the bottom, then you find the magnetic field along the center line pointing in this direction, magnetic field elsewhere pointing in the opposite direction or along the perpendicular, I should say, pointing in the opposite direction, and then kind of pointing like that elsewhere. Okay. And then we can even apply that to a number of loop, turns of loop, or turns of wire, loops of wire. And we get basically the same result if the wire, if the coil is thin compared to the radius. Okay. We've all, all we've done is essentially multiply by N to give us the total magnetic field. Well, when we, when, a, when we have a solenoid, a solenoid behaves a little bit differently. A solenoid is a coil, but it's a very long coil. Okay, a solenoid is a coil, coil, a coil of wire that is much longer than it is wide. At least for how we're defining it. And so, kind of like a long tube like this. If you imagine wrapping a wire around in a very long tube, uh, you find something like this. And what happens is that you have, again, current coming out at the top, going in at the bottom. Inside the solenoid, you're going to get a magnetic field. And the direction is going to be given the same way. And so inside, we have a magnetic field pointing in this direction. Okay, so this is the magnetic field inside the tube here. It turns out that outside of the solenoid, if the solenoid is very, very long compared to its radius, then if you're at an observation location out here, you can actually work it out through superposition uh, that a lot of there's going to be a lot of cancellation going on, that the magnetic field made by each individual loop, okay, you have to take all those into account, but a loop over here is going to be producing a magnetic field. Let's see, there's going to be kind of be pointing that way. Uh, and a loop over here be pointing, may make a field pointing in the opposite direction. And the more loops you have, the greater cancellation you get. And outside... B outside is equal to zero, or effectively, it's approximately equal to zero. Again, it's going to be dependent on how long it is compared to the width. But the longer you can get this compared to its radius, the uh, due to the cancellation effects due to superposition, you'll, you'll actually find that the magnetic field is approximately equal to zero. 
The magnitude, I'm not going to go too much into detail, but the magnitude of this, and you can do more formal proofs with this, by actually ap applying Ampere's law, where remember Ampere's law depends on a loop. And if you imagine a loop that kind of goes down into the, uh, into the solenoid and actually pierces, you have then current piercing through this imaginary loop. You could relate the, uh, the current enclosed by that loop to the magnetic field inside and actually calculate it. Okay? And if you want details, it's in the book. But all we need to know for this particular example we're going to talk about is that the magnetic field inside is non-zero and uniform. It's actually uniform inside as well. So a, a solenoid you can actually use as a way to produce a uniform magnetic field, just like a capacitor you can use as a way to, uh, to produce a uniform electric field. Outside the solenoid is equal to zero. Okay? Just the factoid that we need. Given that, let's think about a question. Here's a solenoid that is running through the inside of a metal ring. Okay? So I've, I've got a long, long solenoid. Current is running through it in the same way we drew it over there. I'm not sure if you can see this, but the conventional current is coming out of the top, going in at the bottom. So it's wrapping around like this. It's producing in the interior a magnetic field pointing along the positive x direction. Okay? I've got a metal ring that's in the YZ plane, and I've just made the solenoid coaxial with the ring. Okay, so if I were looking at this uh, head on, just to get the geometry right here, if I'm looking down, sort of down the, the length of the tube, that's the solenoid, and then I just have a ring surrounding it. Okay and then this is the, the positive x-axis would be coming out towards us in the, from this point of view. Okay? So given that, we have a solenoid of radius of 2 centimeters. The ring that surrounds it has a radius of 10 centimeters. The magnetic field inside the solenoid is uniform and it's half a tesla, 0.5 tesla. Outside, again, as we said, the magnetic field is approximately equal to zero. What's the magnetic flux through the outer ring? What's the magnetic flux through the outer ring? Okay, so we have a, just a bare majority saying answer number two, although there are two other popular answers. One is zero, and the other one is four. Well, first of all, we're... Uh, we're just calculating the flux, and we're not calculating a change in flux. Now, there is a ma magnetic field here. If it's not changing, it actually isn't going to produce any EMF. Okay? In fact, the derivative, time derivative of it would be zero. But if we just, have, if we just want to find the flux, that's just B times the area. Okay? So we are going to have some magnetic flux through this region because there is some magnetic field. But where is the magnetic field? only in the solenoid, right? Everywhere else, it's equal to zero. So if I'm thinking about calculating the flux, and let's draw it again, uh, looking down, down the solenoid, sort of head on here. Then I have magnetic field coming out in this region, and magnetic field out here equal to zero. So if I'm looking at this, this total area over the whole ring, what part of that area is going to contribute a non-zero flux? Just the solenoid. Just the solenoid, right? So only the area of the solenoid is going to matter here when we're calculating the magnetic flux. Think about dividing it up into pieces. It, again, what this summation is telling us, or this integral is telling us, is we're summing up by dividing up the total area, which is the area of the ring, into little uh, squares, okay? And then thinking about the magnetic flux through each one of those squares. Well, for every single square out here, the magnetic field is zero, right? So when I sum up the flux, I'm going to get a zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus zero. So I keep adding up a flux of zero until I get to the interior here where the solenoid is jutting through, okay? And only that area is going to contribute, contribute a non-zero. 
So the total flux then is going to be the magnetic field of the solenoid times pi times the radius of the solenoid, not the radius of the ring, squared. Okay, And that should give you, uh, what did we say it was, 2.5 Tesla? 0 0.5 Tesla pi times uh, 0.02 squared, which is answer number 2, I believe, 6.3 times 10 to the minus 4 Tesla meters squared. Okay? Questions there? But most people got that, but some confusion about what area to use. And the way to think about it is you're using, you're thinking about summing up the flux of the entire area, but just in a lot of that area, B is equal to zero. So only this part is going to contribute. Okay? Yeah, the mag that's right. The magnetic flux over the whole ring turns out to be equal to the magnetic flux just over the center. Because again, it's like, it's like having two separate areas and you're adding them together. The flux over this you know, circle-shaped piece is all going to be zero plus the flux of the interior, which is giving us that. And that just gives us you know, 6.3 times 10 to the minus 4. Okay? Other questions? Okay. So now let's say that flux is changing. So maybe we have a power supply attached to our solenoid. We're going to uh, change the current so that the interior, the magnetic field, uh, or the magnetic field in the interior changes from 6.3 times 10 to the minus 4 tesla meters squared to 2.3 times 10 to the minus 4 tesla meters squared in a time of 0.1 seconds. Okay, so we're just reducing the magnitude of the magnetic field in a very short amount of time. What's the EMF induced in the outer ring? See if you can remember how we did this type of problem last time. The EMF in the outer ring. So again, think about definition of Faraday's law here. So, okay, answer number four, four times 10 to the minus three volts. We're just doing exactly what we did last time was what we're, we're making a approximation that because the time is very short, relatively short, let's just say this derivative we can approximate as a discrete difference over of, in flux over a discrete difference in time. And uh, so it's like finding the average EMF over this short time period. Just find the change in flux, which is going to be 4 times 10, or 6.3 times 10 to the minus 4 tesla meters squared, minus 2.3 times 10 to the minus 4 tesla meters squared. We're given the fluxes here, not fields. So that difference is 4 times 10 to the minus 4 divided by 0.1 is 4 times 10 to the minus 3 volts. Okay, so you get 4 millivolts induced in the outer uh, outer ring. Okay, pretty straightforward. Questions here? What about the direction? Could we get the direction if the field just reduced? Let's see if we can redraw this. From this point of view, we had magnetic field coming out towards us, and then the magnetic field kept the same direction but uh, just reduced in magnitude. So that is B final. Delta B is in, and it's a little hard to draw in perspective here, but delta B is pointing in. Negative dBdt is then pointing out, and then from the right-hand rule we get would get a current, an electric field, a curly electric field, and therefore also a current induced in uh, in this direction because negative dBdt is out. Okay, we've done that before too. Questions? Yes. Yeah. That, well, in fact, forget the ring for just a second. Even if the ring wasn't here, because there is a changing magnetic field, you're going to get an electric field. And, it's, and it just from the symmetry of this thing, it's going to follow a sort of curly pattern around the uh, outside of this uh, the solenoid. Okay. Now we happen to put a, so that's ENC. Now you happen to put a ring there. If there's a ring, a metal ring, in the presence of this electric field, and while the ring has mobile charges in it, and so that electric field can drive a current in the ring, and conventional current would flow in the same direction. Right? Uh, yeah, the voltage you would measure would be the same. The electric field, depending on the radius, electric field would be different because 
the EMF is the same, but if, remember when we, when we did this last time, this, this will boil down to ENC times 2 pi R, right? So if you have a bigger radius, uh, the field would necessarily go down, right, to get the same voltage, which kind of, which kind of makes sense because the farther the way you get, the, the smaller the field should be. But the voltage around trip should be the same, or the EMF, I should say, round trip should be the same. Okay. Other questions? Okay, let's uh, let's do another example, and we've been doing some problems where we, we find sort of a discrete difference. I'm going to look at a case where we have a magnetic field that's varying continuously with time. So, for example, if I just have a, um, let me just do something like this. If we have a magnetic field in some region pointing out of the plane of the board, And similar sort of thing. Let's just say it, the magnetic field is confined to this circular region, kind of like a solenoid if there's only magnetic field within the solenoid. Everywhere else, B is equal to zero, okay, outside of this radius. Let's say this is a radius R. So outside R, B is equal to zero. Inside let's say the magnitude of the magnetic field is given by a function, an explicit a function that has an explicit relationship with time. So it's increasing as t squared. So t is time. k is just a constant. So let's say k is equal to 2 times 10 to the minus 3 tesla per second squared. Okay, so, it, so for example, at t equals 0, b is equal to 0. Right, at t equals one second, uh, b would be equal to two times to the minus three tesla, and and so on. Okay, t equals two seconds, it'd be uh, four times that, eight times ten to the minus uh, three, ten to the minus three tesla. So it's just it's just increasing as a quadratic, basically increasing as with a square of time. And we want to find similar sort of thing. Find the EMF in the loop of radius r, and then we could also find ENC, okay? Well, now in this case, uh, you want to be careful because in the previous cases, we were given two different discrete values of magnetic field or, or magnetic flux at particular times, and they were very close apart. In this case, I'm given the magnetic field as a function of time. EMF is equal to the negative of the derivative of the magnetic flux. What could I just do? Take the derivative, right? And I can say that the EMF is equal to negative EDT. Um, and by the way, let's just look at the magnitude and we'll get the direction later. So I'm not going to worry about the sign yet. EMF is going to be equal to negative, or excuse me, uh, derivative with respect to time of the magnetic flux. This is a uniform magnetic field over this circular area. So that's just going to be B times A for my flux. We have the time derivative of this function of mag for magnetic field, K to T squared. And the area is pi R squared. The area doesn't depend, it doesn't depend on time. K doesn't depend on time. So the only thing that we have here is T squared that depends on time. So I have K pi R squared. And derivative T squared is just 2T. Okay? And now that's giving me the EMF as a function of time. So there's a case where the EMF is going to be changing with time. If the magnetic field is changing as T squared, the EMF is then changing as t. So the, the, the larger, the longer I wait, the bigger the EMF is going to be. I could evaluate it at some specific point in time. Let's say at t equal to 3.0 seconds. Okay. So I could just plug it in once I've calculated it 
and say that this is uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 3 times pi times a radius. What's the radius? Uh, let's make the radius uh, 10 centimeters. So this is 0 0.1 meters. 0 0.1 squared times 2 times 3 seconds, which gives you something. What's that work out to be? Anybody get a number? 3 minus 3 pi, 0 0.1 squared times 6. So that's 12. 1.77 e to the negative 4. Okay. 3. Thank you. 3. 1.77 times 10 to the minus 3 volts? 3.77 times 10 to the minus 4. Okay, gotcha. 3.77 times 10 to the minus 4, and the units are volts for EMF. And then if we wanted to find the electric field, again, just based on the symmetry, we would assume that the electric field, again, is pointing in sort of this curly pattern, uniform everywhere. And so, again, we have a circular path. We can say that this is just going to be ENC times 2 pi r, and you can, you can solve for the electric field. Okay? But the point is that when you're dealing with a, a situation like this where you have an explicit function or a magnetic field explicitly depending on time, don't plug in the numbers right away. Okay? Take the, you want to take the derivative first. If I, now if I take the derivative, or if I, one common mistake is to say that, okay, I want to find this at time equals 3. I can plug in b at t equals 3, and then I'd have uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 3 times 9. Okay, t squared, and so that is going to be 18 times 10 to the minus 3. And then I can say, okay, well, then it's going to be that times pi r squared, and that's my EMF. Well, that's telling you the EM, or that's telling you the flux at that particular instant in time. It's not telling you how the flux is changing with time. And the difference is basically the difference between instantaneous and average quantities, okay, when you're talking about changes. So, for example, if you have a position, back to sort of physics one type things, if you have a position as a function of time and it's changing like a parabola, if it, it's something like kt squared, where k is, has something as the acceleration, or one half at squared, to make it more familiar. Well, if you calculate the position here and try to find the velocity by taking the difference between this point and the starting point, in other words, finding that slope, what did you just find? That's, that's the average velocity, right? So this, is, this slope would be V average as delta X over delta T, where your average is going from 0 to T final here. It's not going to be a very good approximation to the instantaneous velocity, right? What's the instantaneous velocity at that point? How we graphically, what do you do? It's the tangent, right? It's the tangent. So it's the slope of the tangent. That's dx dt. Okay. Same sort of thing here. You have to figure out the derivative first to get the instantaneous rate of change of uh, the flux and then plug in the time you're interested in to find the EMF. Okay, so don't try to calculate. If you're given a situation like this where you know the uh, function, uh, just be careful about how you calculate the, uh, the EMF. Okay? Questions here?